welcome to the second day of the Women in Content Summit. Um, I think many of you might have um, been at the um, half an hour introduction to quantum computing yesterday. So I think these are just meant to kick off the day and then the formal introduction to the event will happen a little bit later in half an hour. My job is now in this half an hour to give you an overview to quantum machine learning because this is basically the topic that a lot of this day will be concerned with. Um, just about my background, um, uh, my name is Maria Schult. I'm working for uh, Xanadu. I also work, um, Xanadu is um, a quantum startup. We develop uh, photonic-based quantum hardware, and we're also maybe quite well known for our quantum machine learning software library, Penny Lane. Um, I also work for the University of Kwasi Natal here down in Durban in South Africa. This is where I'm tuning in from. Okay, cool. So um, what you heard yesterday, and um, those of you who work in quantum computing for a long time will be very... Um, you know, uh, knowledgeable about this, is that quantum computing has really made a big change in the last couple of years from an academic discipline, or sometimes called good old quantum computing, so what you read in Nielsen and Chuang, the Bible of quantum computation. Uh, but since like around five years, we are in the era of near-term quantum computing. What does that mean? We have devices available. Uh, you might have seen also in, in terms of research, this actually means quite a lot because all of a sudden you can write papers by implementing experiments. So papers are not just computational complexity bounds on your algorithms, but it has really changed quite a lot, um, you know, the breadth of what we can do. And um, as part of this emerging technology, all of as all sorts of companies came in. So this was a slide from uh, quite a while back, but I went through the Wikipedia quantum players list or something. I just put logos here. Uh, and you see that um, quantum computing, especially in this near term, is done by a lot of companies. And these companies have a problem because, I mean, if you're in a bigger company, you have to justify to your boss what's happening. If you're a startup, you need venture to capital capitalists to be convinced. Um, not only that you can develop quantum computers, but what to use them for, and not only the quantum computers we have in 10 or 20 years, but also the near-term machines. So you, you're looking actually for an application which doesn't need the most accurate results because you know these new, these prototype devices are very noisy. You also need an application that actually gives us billions of dollars at least. Um, and actually talent is a very big thing in, you know, at least in the startup world and in in business, so we need to attract young researchers. And machine learning really, or quantum machine learning, was born in somehow, in some sense, in this transition of like um, starting in this traditional way of doing quantum computing. And now a lot of quantum machine learning in these days is very much based on this near term thinking. So, but what are the conditions of having actually a quantum advantage in machine learning? So, quantum machine learning is um, basically looking for can quantum computers give us any advantage for normal machine learning problems? There are also like uh, questions of like, can it give us any quantum advantages for particular quantum problems? So analyze quantum data, things like that. But I will focus here on traditional machine learning. And yesterday I sat down and I actually like came up with um, four kind of basically categories of these advantages. And maybe you want to fulfill all of them to have something that's really breaking through. Um, the first one is relevance. Does your problem solve a relevant problem in machine learning? Sounds a bit trivial, but um, sometimes we have an algorithm that we need to make lots of assumptions in proving that it's better than something else. And all of a sudden, we need to make assumptions on the data we're using. And sometimes these assumptions are things that people don't care about in classical machine learning. Then we have performance. So does the algorithm actually learn well? And this is super important here because um, in traditional quantum computing, performance is always speed in some sense. Like, is your algorithm fast? In quantum machine learning, you really have to rethink this. Performance means you can do learning well, right? And this means, and we will see this now, you can generalize from seen data to unseen data. And so quantum machine learning also has like early thought about speed for a lot of years. And like in the last couple of years, we see more and more ideas about generalization performance. But the third one is obviously speed. So this is still there. If your algorithm isn't faster than a classical one, why would you use a quantum computer? I'm personally not so often very interested in the speed argument, but I think it's it's important in this mosaic. And then the fourth one now with near-term quantum computing, and especially for the companies, like people like me, is availability. So when can we actually employ your algorithm? If you have Shaw's algorithm for quantum machine learning, it could be really nice, but um, maybe you can't do anything with it now. Okay, cool. And what I'll do here, basically, I'll, um, I'll give you a quick introduction to machine learning, introduce to you my graphical notation for quantum computing that I'll use, and then I go through three algorithm ideas and basically evaluate those four measures. And we can see, like, so these ideas are taken from very diverse parts of quantum machine learning. So you can see that really every algorithm does very good on some and not so good on, on others. Okay, what you need to know about machine learning. 
Um, the first ingredient of machine learning is data. So basically there are three ingredients that I will develop and then I'll define what's the problem of machine learning. Um, on the left, so data can be given in pairs. Um, many of you will have heard of supervised learning where your goal is to predict outputs Y from inputs X. And so on the left, you've got data example for uh, a regression task where your outputs are just like continuous values. On the right, you have a classification task where your outputs could be one of two classes, for example, in binary classification. But data could also be just data sampled from a distribution. So this is like unsupervised learning where you don't have any labels. Um, I thought like maybe it's nice to visualize this a bit better than just points, but think of, for example, a super simple image classification task. Now we are in uh, classification, so it's basically the second part. We have images from class A and B, and what determines class A is that the images are um, stripes or bars in a pix four pixel image. It's like a super simple data set. The second ingredient of machine learning is a model family. And most of you have heard of neural networks, maybe of support vector machines, linear models, regression, whatever. Um, and the model family basically gives you or reproduces the correlation or the, the structure of your data set. And in the classification and regression task, th these will be just functions that map inputs to outputs. In the unsupervised case, you um, usually have a probability distribution or a model that's a probability distribution or probabilistic model, maybe a generator that basically samples the data. So your model will be really good if you think that your data was sampled from this probability distribution. So as an example, for as a super, so in the supervised classification task, you could have, for example, the three models. And I use this also to say that models, we always think of trainable models, but it could be just three hypotheses. So you can say if A, um, so it's data A, if there's a row or column filled, else B, we know this is actually the true hypothesis for our data set, or two like alternative ones. And the third ingredient is a, a loss which we can use to construct like something like a cost function on, a, on the model family. And this will pick us to help us to pick the perfect model, like the best model in this model family. Um, and the loss is very often in, you know, like um, supervised learning, it's kind of the distance between what your model says and what like the data really is, the outputs. So you compare basically predictions, oh, sorry, predictions of your model and like outputs in your data set. And in unsupervised learning, it's a bit harder to uh, quantify. So very often, a loss is basically like, if I would sample from my distribution, are the samples very close to the ones that I've actually seen in my training set? So this green is always my training set here. And in our little example, a loss could basically just say, take an image, for example, this one is not bars and stripes, so it's from class B. And now the loss is uh, one for, if it was like class A, I think, I, I'm just like wondering if this makes any sense. Anyway, so you compare basically like what your model says about the bars and stripes images or not. Could you have a binary loss here, for example? And now machine learning, the goal of machine learning is to minimize the average, and this is in uh, quotation marks, so actually it's the expected loss. Um, but I always got very confused when people talk about expectations. So um, let's just say the average loss of the model on all the data. So in somehow the expected loss over your entire data distribution, that's the exact way to say it. So basically you've got this loss function, and this is your model family here. And now you, you want to like find basically the lowest, the model that like minimizes this loss function that tells you how good your model is. So in our example, this could be for, um, for example, like, uh, so we kind of judge um, for every data point, um, how many of, or for how many data points these uh, hypotheses are fulfilled and then we plot this value. And um, you can see, for example, that F3 is the worst model because the loss is the highest and F1 is the best one. However, for this example, we know all our data because the data set is, I mean, of all possible data is finite. But very often, or in most cases, we, we have absolutely no clue what all the data and what this magic data distribution is that generated the data. So what we only have is a proxy of the loss and which is the training loss. So this is the average loss on a training data of samples from your original data set. Um, so we kind of have to optimize the green curve because the black curve we don't have access to. And um, so you see that the green curve can differ quite a lot from the black curve. And this is basically the difference between your training error and your generalization error. So the training error is how good your model trains in the end. So how good is it on the training set? And the generalization error is how does it predict unseen data? And um, so you can understand this as like, for example, a model that fits or overfits the data has a really low training error, but a high generalization error. And this is in our example. If we only have this training data given, we actually don't know if F1 or F2 is the better one. So this is the problem kind of to have the green information, the data information, and estimate that one. 
And then as you all know, to measure the black curve, we can do something else. We take test data that we haven't seen in the training algorithm, and we have a third curve, so to speak, that we use as a proxy for, for the black curve to see if a trained model is doing well or not. So much for machine learning. Now, I know this is a tour de force, but I don't have a lot of time. Now, quantum computing. And um, so you heard the introduction yesterday. Um, the only thing I want to do, I want to basically make uh, this graphical notation that I will use for the examples in quantum machine learning. And this graphical notation is a circuit notation that you will have seen yesterday. We have n qubits. And you know that these n qubits are described by two to the n dimensional vector. And out of this vector, we can read uh, probabilities of finding the qubits in certain states. Quantum computing is then um, some processing that is a unitary um, operation or unitary operator applied to the system. And we can model this as a unitary matrix multiplying this two to the n-dimensional state. So there's some ambulance here. And you get some other state that gives you another distribution. And now quantum computer usually always measures. Um, the simplest version is a measurement in the computational basis. So you actually sample bit strings that tell you how the qubits, what states the qubits were in from this distribution. Basically, a quantum computer is a sampler of bit strings. And then to make this algorithm, so sometimes in machine learning, uh, in, not only in machine learning, in quantum computing, we want to make this algorithm deterministic, which means we uh, want a, basically, we don't want like a stochastic result. Every time I run, I get a different result. Um, and what I do, I kind of like um, do my measurement a lot of times, and then I post-process the measurement to get some stochastic information out of this measurement, or some statistical information out of this measurement. And so what we always think about is expectations. You've heard of quantum expectations a lot if you're a physicist, um, which in practice just mean you run your algorithm a lot of times, and then you average over the result. And this average will be, in some sense, deterministic. If you had infinitely many uh, measurements, and then take the average, you will always kind of get the same result out. So quantum computer estimates this average result. And the mathematical description, if you have done physics 101, you know this, is um, basically you take the vector that is the matrix vector multiplication from your circuit applied to your like initial state distribution. Then you take um, the same vector, but now as a row vector, and then you sandwich a matrix that represents what the measurement is doing. So basically, quantum mechanics, how it's simulated, or quantum computing, how it's simulated in classical computers is linear algebra. It's just a vector matrix vector multiplication. And the circuit determines, or the algorithm determines, what's U and what's M. Although M is usually a computational basis measurement. Uh, and of course, like uh, quantum circuits don't have a big block, but you've heard of quantum gates. So it's uh, chopped into local operation. And now um, one thing that's very important for um, the last approach I will talk about is um, that these gates in traditional quantum computing, they're always fixed. So you have a Toffoli gate or um, a Hadamard gate. But um, in fact, you can also have gates that depend on parameters. So they're often... Um, basically, the most prominent ones are Pauli rotations, which just means you rotate a qubit along an axis um, by a Pauli operator. And then, so these. Out of the family, and my language already suggests this is very similar to machine learning, right? And so, lastly, we need to encode data somehow. So, this is also true in normal machine learning, right? You always start with somehow an initial state that represents your data. Very often you just flip some bits and this then represents your binary data somehow. But there are more interesting variations also in non-machine learning quantum computing. Um, and this will always here be, be shown with this like green box, which is just another circuit that whatever it does, it somehow encodes the data into the quantum state. And um, it's quite interesting to note that basically it, it encodes the data into this quantum state vector. and um, I won't talk about this, but I'm really interested in how this resembles something called a quantum feature map. So you map data into high dimensional spaces and then you do something with this data. So that's just a side note. Okay, cool. So half time and we have spoken about machine learning and quantum computing. So now we can go to the meat of the story, quantum machine learning. And as I said, um, usually I only talk about the third approach, which is like variation of circuits. But um, last week I kind of had to sit down so we have a book on supervised learning, learning with quantum computers, and I have to write updated basically for the second edition because a lot has happened in the last couple of years since it was published. And I started realizing actually quantum machine learning is quite a lot larger than even I think these days because, um, you know, so I picked basically two more algorithms from kind of the breadth of it. 
The first one is actually one of the first approaches that quantum machine learning has used a lot, and I'm really simplifying it a lot here, but the essence is, is um, quite simple to understand. The algorithms are technically absolutely, I mean, it's really terrible to understand if you're not a real expert in quantum computing. But I give you the overview. And the idea here is, okay, we're only focusing on the third goal, the speed-ups. We want to somehow take a classical machine learning example and we want to speed it up. And classical machine learning, not so much neural networks, but the older versions like support vector machines, linear regression, they often uh, define convex optimization problems. And even if you don't know what that is, a convex optimization problem is a matrix or can often be represented by a matrix inversion problem. So approach here is take this matrix inversion problem and outsource it to a quantum device. Um, so and I'll just write it like this, but this matrix A usually depends on your data somehow, and this Z here depends usually on your outputs in a supervised learning model, and this B would be, for example, your weight vector that you want to find, like the weights of the model. So now you use an embedding or encoding routine, and the one you use here is often amplitude encoding, so you associate B with the amplitudes of a quantum state. Um, and after this, you have a, a quantum system that is in a state that's like kind of associate or the same as this, this vector that you had. Now you apply a circuit and the physicist amongst you see what this means here immediately. So in some, so as a physicist, this means you evolve your quantum system by a Hamiltonian A for time one. <laughs> but for all of you who don't know what this is, this basically just means your quantum algorithm somehow depends on the matrix A and this is the way you encode it. And now you use lots of tricks that you chain that people have invented before to write the eigenvalues and not only the eigenvalues, the inverted eigenvalues into the amplitude vector. And then the final amplitude vector will be of this form. And so you have an amplitude vector that's element wise exactly the same as Z. Sorry, Z, sorry, Z is your weight vector that you want to find. Uh, so the other way around. And then um, in the end, so as a result of this quantum algorithm, you don't have a trained model or something. You don't have the weights themselves, but you have a quantum state that corresponds to the weights. And you can now do lots of things. You can measure out all these weights, but this would take a lot of time. I mean, so much time that it might not be interesting to do this algorithm at all. But maybe you can use this vector to do something like a classification task. So you could take uh, an overlap with another vector that um, encodes a new input and can see, for example, what's the magnitude of this, and this can give you like prediction results. So do something interesting with this weight vector. And now here's the crux, why is this like one of the first quantum algorithms, quantum machine learning algorithms uh, scrutinized is um, this part here to um, these ingenious tricks, they are really efficient. So you can do them in time that is logarithmic in the size of A. And that's insane, right? In time that's much smaller than even the dimension of A. So that means that if you can uh, you have an embedding and apply a circuit of this form and do something interesting with the circuit after, that is in time that's also logarithmic in the data set size, which sounds like really strange. But so if you've got very efficient data loading and data post-processing, then your algorithm is extremely, extremely efficient. And lots of the literature and why it's so hard to evaluate really tells you just like about how can we load this in very fast times. And then what happens is when you say like, oh, okay, we can you know, simulate a quantum system by A in so, so much time, um, often you have to make very, very strict assumptions on how A looks like. So it's not very general. And if A represents your data, that means you make lots of assumptions on how your data is actually represented. Um, this is kind of like in my graphical notation, what's happening just to recap like the embedding, the evolution and this clever stuff that you do. And then your measurement does something that's not just a computational basis measurement, but some prediction idea. So this is how it looks now in this graphical notation. So let's go through the four points of what these types. So this is a representative of a type of approach. So what about performance? I shuffle them now. Uh, this is the easiest one because we're actually not doing anything new. We're literally just taking something that the machine learning people do and we just make it faster. So the performance is yes by just extension of what they do. If their algorithms performs, ours do as well because we get the same results. Speed up. Um, so again, like I told you, under very specific assumptions on how you encode data, you can get an exponential speed up over classical algorithms, so which is like what people were very crazy about at the beginning. But now the relevance is not entirely clear because of these assumptions that like, um, you know, like introduce um, very strict requirements on the problems you can look at with this. 
And now the really bad thing is the availability. So all of these nice tricks that people use, um, you know, we can't do this on near-term devices. And then people always say fault-tolerant quantum computers will take 10 years. And when people say 10 years, it basically means no one has an idea. Okay, cool. Just five minutes for this approach. And I've got 10 for the last two, which is great. Now let's completely switch gears and look at something completely different in machine learning. And this is now an example of uh, unsupervised learning. I thought maybe just throwing this into the mix. And it is an example of how fault tolerant quantum computers again can speed up uh, unsupervised learning quadratically. Um, so and the, the model or the classical model that we're trying to emulate here or do make quantum here is a probabilistic model. Um, more precisely, it's a, a Bayesian network. And the probabilistic model is the probability distributions over, over variables. And so the probabilistic model itself just tells you how likely it is to observe that it rains, that a sprinkler is on, that the grass is wet in a combination. And if you have this probability, it doesn't tell you much, but you can use this, for example, for um, supervised learning task by one step. So you compute or, I don't know, you sample or you generate somehow the probability of the last variable that the grass is wet conditioned on that it was raining and that the sprinkler was off, for example. So this type of like, um, you call them the marginalized distribution with a certain evidence. If you get access to this distribution, or if you get access, access to samples from this distribution, there's a fine difference that goes very deep, but like uh, I can't go into this, but then you actually can solve your classification task because you can just like pick if the grass is wet or not by like what's more likely. Bayesian networks are a very specific type of network where um, you have this graphical representation with the errors because some of the um, variables depend on others. And this basically shrinks your probability distribution. This is what classical people use to even write down a probability distribution. So um, for example, here, rain doesn't have a parent, but if the spring is on, would kind of depend on whether it was raining or not. And so this is like the basic idea. So if you do a lot of like deep learning, you might not uh, even use these models a lot, but it's really used a lot in, in healthcare, for example. I mean, machine learning is more than just deep learning and neural networks and images. So. Okay, and now, so how can we now um, understand this from a quantum perspective? Um, the model itself, so if I go back to this like P of RSG, we can actually represent with a quantum circuit that now doesn't have this averaging step. So remember, you just um, have an encoding, so a procedure that prepares a quantum state. The quantum state corresponds to a probability distribution of measurement outcomes. Um, and now you just measure these bit strings. And so um, in the example above, for example, we would have three need three qubits to represent this model because um, you know there are three like uh, bits basically. And now you sample from the distribution P of S, G, R like um, outcomes. And now the interesting thing is you can use, um, or if you have like some way to kind of like change your, um, distribution so that the last or the hang on let me let me do this properly here i should have put this down like as um as a as like kind of a, a specific example but let's see g is the first qubit r the second one and s the third one you want to clamp your second and third qubit to this evidence here because then you can sample from this distribution here as opposed to this distribution this is what you want to do to do a supervised learning prediction so if you have these three qubits, you want to like clamp these two ones so that they're not arbitrary, but you want to know they're always in state like whatever it was, zero and one, or what's your evidence. And it turns out in the idea of this like algorithm, um, oh, I didn't give you a reference. So the, the first matrix inversion one was very general, but this one is actually from a paper that's very beautiful. And it's from Lo and Ch um, Chuang, Chuang from Nielsen and Chuang actually, uh, from a paper from 2014. Um, and the idea is to have a quantum algorithm that's based on amplitude amplification, which is something else, something that's basically Grover search, um, to amplify the states or the basis states, computational basis states that corresponds to your evidence. And so this, in all, in a nutshell, gives you a quadratic speed up over doing this classically by just sampling from the original distribution and rejecting examples. So I know this is quite a mouthful, but basically amplitude amplification can be used to do something that is rejection sampling. Rejection sampling is something we can use to get a decision or a supervised prediction out of an unsupervised black model. Um, and now let's look at our indicators again. So performance, yes, by extension again, because we just quantized a classical model. 
Speed up is quadratically faster. And as far as I understand, you can prove this on paper. So this is not just something that has to do with data encoding and all of those things. So we always know it's quadratically faster. That doesn't mean that there are not implementations of Bayesian nets that use tricks that are even faster than that. It's just the vanilla version of a Bayesian net that we compared to. Compare to. Relevance is very general. I mean, you can do medical processing instead of grass and sprint examples. But again, it's a fault tolerant algorithm amplitude amplification. So we don't have it available very soon. But um, actually from just preparing these slides, I start really thinking that quadratic speed ups for quantum machine learning are very, very interesting, actually. Much more interesting than exponential speed ups where ah, I don't know if I should believe in those to be, you know, you always have to pay a price to prove something is exponentially faster. You always have to make assumptions. And if you don't want to make assumptions, maybe go for quadratic speed ups. And lastly, uh, we can use near-term circuits as supervised models. Um, and this is kind of the approach that I usually speak about and that you might have seen and heard and maybe tried yourself with, you know, lots of the software frameworks are based on this. And this is the idea we take basically the quantum circuit that I developed at the beginning. Again, this is uh, an expectation value that's estimated here after encoding data. You have a circuit that's trainable and you measure and then you uh, compute the expectation. And as I said, this already like looks very much like a machine learning model, right? Like data input, something is trainable. So the idea is literally to just do um, quantum machine learning with um, the approach of taking a neural network, unplugging it from everything from your machine learning pipeline, plugging in a quantum circuit, and then see what happens. And um, what I didn't, um, you know, like want to talk about in depth or something is that one of the big problems that we first faced with this approach was like, how can you train these models? Because um, usually in deep learning training uses uh, gradient descent. So you need to get gradients out of these models. And it turns out you can actually run your model um, usually twice or a few times and you get actually a gradient of this model. So we can now like really plug them into gradient descent deep learning pipelines like that are usually used to train models. I also want to show you this because I think it's quite neat. Like I prepared this also for the second edition of this, this book I was talking about. So what I did here, I literally just like um, took linear data, like a super simple data set. I marked this one here in pink just to know where it, where it goes to. And then I used a Pauli rotation to encode this data set into a qubit. Like um, I didn't encode the whole data set at once, but I encode every data point and now I plot them basically as if I yeah, would have done it once. And now you can see that this variation circuit basically just turns or rotates your data set on the qubit, on the blosphere of the qubit. And so this is simulation. This is not, uh, you know, this really, really happens. And now you can uh, plot what the measurement does. And the measurement gives you an outcome if you measure a qubit between minus one and one. Um, and you can now plot, um, you know, the function between of, you know, your final model. So this is basically this between blue and red here is f of x. What is your model? output, your continuous model output. And when you're at zero, you can say this is the decision boundary where the model flips from like one to a minus one decision. And you see that a measurement literally defines something like it's almost a linear decision boundary um, on the blosphere. And so this is, um, yeah, this is really a cool idea. Okay, cool. Good morning, Maria. Yeah. Or good afternoon. It's Denise. Yes. Hi, Denise. Hi, we are running out of time. Yes, I'm but done, I want to invite you back um, to our next summit because this is so amazing. Cool. Um, uh, I'm very happy to come back. Um, uh, yeah, I just put up the last slide with the analysis. Wait, let me know. Okay. Screen in here. And then I hand over to you. Thank you very much.